1996, world-renowned alpaca breeder Don Julio Barreda wondered, is there anything American alpaca breeders could do to help the poor Quechua children of my hometown of Makassani? The answer was yes, and Quechua Benefit was born. Mi nombre es Elena Barreda. Actualmente trabajo en apoyo desde sus inicios, porque papá compartía mucho el cariño de los niños ¿no? con nosotros. Siempre estaba en la conversación de la familia el, la importancia que tenían los niños, no solamente en cuanto a, a sus necesidades materiales, sino también enseñarles valores, ¿no? como el amor a la patria. Alpacas are raised at altitudes of between 12 and 16,000 feet in the central highlands of Peru. This extreme elevation is the last plateau upon which man can survive. Rosa and her husband, together with their seven children, occupy a 10 by 15 foot tobacco colored hut constructed of mud bricks. It has no running water, no electricity, no drainage, no toilet, and no bath. Smoke from the cook fire hovers at the blackened ceiling of the golden thatched roof, evaporating through the straw into thin air, like mist from a pond. The floor is dirt. On nights when the wind whistles and the ice on the ground is covered by snow, a basic function, such as going outside to relieve oneself, is not a reasonable alternative. Alpacas connect the supporters of Quechua Benefit to the Quechua people of Peru. These people care for 95% of the alpacas here on Earth. My name's Mike Safley, and I began to work with the Quechua poor at the request of a man who would become a dear friend, Don Julio Barreda. You're welcome to Casa Chapi. The Casa Chapi Children's Home is dedicated to his memory. He was an alpaca breeder, a simple shepherd at first glance, but he had a wisdom that radiated far beyond alpacas. Our story begins with his simple request, can you help my people? My love for the Peruvian people, the desire to give back to the Quechua, because I'm an alpaca breeder as well, I just kind of feel a connection. The difficulty of the Quechua people's lives is reflected by the infant mortality figures reported by Jorge Flores Ocha in his book, Pastoralists of the Andes. 26% of the infants born are dead before age one. 37.5% are dead before age five. 42% of all babies born are dead before they reach the age of 10. My favorite interaction that we had was a very young woman. She was 38 weeks pregnant and full term is 40 weeks. And she had never heard her baby's heartbeat. She was just very uptight and really scared about what she was about to go through. She had so many questions for us and just question after question. It, I think we really helped to reassure her that everything was gonna be all right. These dismal facts have not changed over time, yet the Andy and alpaca communities have persisted. Most people could not exist in similar circumstances. Here, everything is altered by the altitude. Temperatures reach freezing in bright sunlight. Mountain peaks, when viewed in the thin air and blinding light, seem near enough to touch, but run away forever as you approach. The men and women who live at these perilous altitudes are constantly challenged. Rosa walks with her shoulders pulled back by the weight of her baby, who's wrapped in the green and red striped poncho tied at her neck. The ever-present hat, worn in the ancient fashion of her Pueblo's women, marks her birthplace, the same area where she might have 12 children before she dies. Her ruby-red bell-shaped skirts are layered over hand-spun, hand-knitted alpaca leggings, worn like a fancy woman's stockings, but giving better protection against the hostile weather. As team leader, I basically help organize the doctors and the volunteers, especially in the pharmacy. My role is kind of to make sure everything goes smoothly for the doctors and to see that they get what they need in order to see the patients. Mario and I cut a water bottle in half, cut the top off, taped around the top and cut a little nose piece off, put the inhaler in and put it on the baby's face, kind of like a mask, and we're able to spray the albuterol inhaler like a spacer device. And it worked like a gem, it was wonderful. And so, <laughs> I think mom may have thought we were crazy, but that's okay, <laughs> it worked. 
teams of doctors, dentists, surgeons, optometrists, and caring alpaca breeders have been returning to Peru ever since that first mission in 1996. In 2013, a mission team visited an area so remote that the patients could not remember ever having any gringos pass through before. We were in high country in the heart of alpaca breeding, very remote, uh, very isolated, very hard to get to, <laughs> and very cold. Um, but it was definitely worth the effort to get out there and to meet the people. The road was like right there, and you're like, Ooh, everybody, everybody moved to the right, because <laughs> we thought we were gonna go over to the side, but it was an interesting drive. I love the trip to the highlands, but it was hair-raising at times. The people up there are so tough. I just, I just admire them so much. The Highlands, I think, was one of the most difficult mission trips that I've been on and our group has been on. We went into places where Americans have never been before, but that's where the greatest needs are. I mean, it's fun to go to places that are easy to get to and where people are, but most of those people have medical needs met. But to go to these places where no Americans had ever been to provide medical care is pretty exciting. In our last clinic, we saw, oh, I guess 367 patients, and just to see the joy that community had. We had the whole community involved, the schools, all the people of the town, and just all the joy they had that we were there and helping them was the most rewarding part of the trip. We were on some pretty treacherous roads, but uh, once we got there, um, set the clinic up, it was a beautiful location. We saw a lot of patients that day, a whole lot of kids and it was just uh, an overall good experience. A typical team sees about 300 patients a day, working from morning to night. They pull teeth, examine babies, and care for pregnant mothers. They hand out worm medicine, antibiotics, neonatal vitamins, and pain medicine. They strive to see everyone, but that's often impossible. The mayor of one of the cities gave a little speech. He was really touched by the fact that um, people would come from a continent away and give their time and money to help people that their own government had forgotten. Don Julio said that the need in Peru is like a dripping faucet. It never stops. Why do people donate their hard-earned money, participate in medical missions, contribute their skills, and volunteer for a largely forgotten people? It's easy to recite Quechua Benefits accomplishments 75,000 patients and counting have received free medical and dental treatments, all provided by volunteers. The support of feeding programs that have provided hundreds of thousands of free meals, and the construction of Casa Chapi's Children's Village that shelters some of the poorest kids on earth. Quechua Benefit has accomplished a lot, all through the generosity and effort of hundreds of volunteers. All of this explains what and how, but not why. Over time, I've begun to realize that love is the most likely reason why. My love of Peru and for the people here, I think it's been said that charitable work is really um, selfish in that the people who serve end up getting more from serving than the people who we are serving. The range of emotion surrounding any act of charity can originate from pity, an inner need to help, or a disciplined desire to give back. We can sacrifice, be faithful, donate to charity, help our friends and lead upright lives. But without love, good deeds lose meaning and are often not sustainable. The Benedictine monks of the Catholic Church believe we should visit the sick, clothe the poor, and shelter the oppressed. But this tells us what to do. It does not explain why we do it. I think it's important that whatever gift God has given us that we give back. I mean, we can't if God gave me a gift to practicing medicine, my role is to give that back in some way. I see the Quechua people as deserving of our charity, not because they are alpaca breeders, although that's what attracted me to them in the first place, but because they deserve to be loved. The English poet, William Blake, had this to say about love. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease, and builds a heaven and hell's despair. That's the right thing to do. I'm buying my way into heaven, hopefully. It was just a beautiful thing to see them um, appreciate us, and in turn, I so appreciated them. 
I really like taking care of people, and uh, I found a group of people that I love working with. Um, the kids. You know, the kids bring you back. This is where I'm called to be. 87% of all donations to Catch with Benefit go directly to programs in Peru. We are an all-volunteer organization with no paid staff in the United States. The directors of Quechua Benefit receive no compensation. Quechua Benefit is taking aid directly to the people who need it without it being filtered through bureaucracies and a lot of money being spent for nothing. And uh, it's very efficient and they make good use of the uh, volunteers and the doctors. And another thing, there's donors aren't giving their money to pay for us to be here. Everyone who comes on these uh, trips pays their own way, buy their own plane tickets, they even pay a mission fee. We don't stay at luxury hotels by any means. I get more back than I give. The charity is grateful for foreign support from Canada, Peru, Germany, Australia, Europe, and England. Catch with Benefit believes that volunteers and donors will continue to contribute as long as they feel the love that's generated by their gifts of time and treasure. We invite you to join with us and help turn love into hope for the Quechua children of Peru.